Welcome everybody. I'm gonna start the program. They just this is um, we're just excited to have Linda Ratsky back. Um, we had her via Zoom a few years ago, and the friends of the library said, let's do this again for real. So Linda is accompanied by David Gibson on the piano, the keyboard here, and, and uh, this program, I'm Judy Byron, I didn't say that, but I'm the adult program coordinator here at the library. And um, this program is um, sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council, and Linda's part of the Speakers Bureau. And what the Vermont Humanities Council, they're about lifelong education. Um, from you know, as long as you're walking and reading and hearing and whatever, um, breathing, dreaming, breathing, breathing. <laughs> so anyway, they're they're about uh, just fostering education, literacy. They do book discussions, all kinds of things, and so many of our programs are um, part of the Vermont Humanities Council, and, and Linda and David are part of that as well. And the friends of the library. Um, whom many are interspersed. Um, we are so grateful so for their support. They're our right arm, and they they do fundraising for us. They um, do book sales. Uh, they do outreach uh, and sponsor programs like this one. And I just wanted to make mention. There's a sign up sheet in the back that if you're interested, uh, please do sign up, and you can also get our monthly newsletter if you're not already. Um, so we're grateful for the friends um, for this event. And um, I'm going to let you introduce your program, because you know it better than I. <laughs> I'll start with a song. All right. <laughs> There's a wave of indignation rolling round and round the land. And its mission is so mighty, and its mission is so grand, that none but knaves and cowards dare deny its just demands as we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? As we go marching on. Whence came your foolish notion, now so greatly overgrown, that a woman's sober judgment is not equal to your own. As God ordained that judgment is a lip for you alone, as we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? As we go marching on, ye men who wrong your mothers and your wives and sisters too, how dare you rob companions who are always faith and true? How dare you make them servants who are all the world to you as they go marching on? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men Men and brothers, dare you do it as we go marching on. Thank you. And for those of us who have been in protest movements, our friend Pete Seeger said, if the audience, if the people know the tune, half your work is done. <laughs> so by using that tune, the suffragists create a lot of words that helped um, sort of convinced people. But if you think about the women who were in hoop skirts in 1848, and you go all the way up to my costume, which is 1920, you get a sense of the long progress that women and men, their allies, made to get the vote in the 19th, the 19th Amendment. You know, because nobody gives up power without a fight. And I knew that. But this program is called From the Parlor to the polling place. And I think what I've noticed is a lot of times they started with a few women gathering in their parlors, talking about the inequality, and then maybe going to the church basement. I always think about the Wesleyan there because the Methodist church often would say, 
sure, you're part of the ab abolitionist movement, you're part of the temperance movement, come here and use our space because we believe in equal representation. And of course the next step would be the town hall, which was, which was frightening to women. They hadn't had any experience in public speaking. Well, unless you were a Quaker, then you were allowed to speak. And after the town hall, it was the state legislature, and then, of course, eventually, they had to go to Washington to change it. So I, I really like to look at how people changed their tactics through the years, from Elizabeth Kitty Stanton all the way to Alice Paul. Here's a song from the early days. It's from the Civil War, 1863. So the first uh, convention for women's rights was held in my hometown, Seneca Falls, New York, 1948. Do go and visit if you can. And after a while, women would gather together just in their own homes. Most farmhouses had a piano or a nasty organ or something. And they could buy the sheet music and sing it at home. So this, you can see the, the covers are so wonderful on the sheet music. But it was written for a specific singer with no name, Mrs. John Wood, <laughs> that was really a problem for me doing this research because none of the women had names. So eventually if there's like a, uh, a couple of um, adjectives or something, I can figure it out. But it has a kind of militant tone, uh, kind of a feminist tone. And I think maybe it wasn't meant for people to, con to gather together. I think it was made, maybe made for the women itself, and it reminds me a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan, and it has a great title, I Will Speak My Mind If I Die For It. <laughs> Men tell us to spit for wives to submit to their husbands submissively weakly. And whatever they say, their wives should obey unquestioning, stupidly, meekly. Our husbands would force us their own dictum take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't, and I can't, and I don't, and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. It's all fudge to say man's the best judge of what should be and shouldn't and so on. That woman should bow nor attempt to say how she considers matters should go on. I never yet gave up myself as a slave, however my husband might try for it. For I can't and I won't and I don't and I can't, but I will speak my mind if I die for it. I hope with the husbands to cope with the rights of the sex will not trifle. We all, if we choose our tongues but to use, can all opposition soon stifle. Let man, if he will, then bid us be still and silent, a price he'll pay high for it. For we won't, and we can't, and we don't, and we shan't. Let us all speak our minds if we die for it. Besides the Friends of the Library and Judy Byron, I'd like to uh, thank Skip Flanders from the Waterbury Historical Society. He did a lot of research about women in Waterbury, and he found a petition. For many years, Vermont women would go to the State House with a petition signed by thousands asking for the right to vote, and of course it was always turned down. But it was fun for me to see the Waterbury list. I'll, I'll put it up there later. A lot of the names I know from today and when they signed it, it was often initials. K.E. Henry, she was married to Luther Henry, but her name was Catherine Boyce. So it's hard to do this research. But there were about 12 people who, vote, who signed this petition in 1870, that's really early times, and eight of them are buried right here in Hope Cemetery. I noticed oh, wow. only one of them actually lived along enough long enough to vote in 1921. So there was many, many decades of work. And uh, I noticed too that a lot of the signers were the wives of ministers, of um, business owners, of doctors, people who were sort of 
prominent in the community, and that often happened with power in the small towns. It changed later on. So here is a dedication to Miss Colley, Miss Elizabeth Colley. She was a prominent socialist, socialist, <laughs> suffragist, maybe. She came <laughs> after an education at Bates College to teach at the Baptist Seminary, which later on ran at the Green Mountain Cemetery, so you know that building, seminary. And during the summer to make a living, she rented those homes to tourists. And Miss Colley got to vote. She died in 1925. So this song is giving the ballot to the mothers. And I think the argument here is we respect our mothers. How can we insult them by not allowing them the privilege of citizenship? And the final song I'll sing has the same tune, but with a different atmosphere about it. And this was, a lot of times they used a tune that everybody knew. This was the Civil War tune that you could hear at rallies. Because I think mother has a lot of emotional baggage to it. So it's really a good way to <laughs> argue that mothers deserve to be citizens. Bring the good old bugle boys and sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the cause along. Sing it where they ought to sing it cheerily and strong. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we sing this chorus from the mountain to the sea. Giving the ballot to our mothers. Bring the dear old banner boys and flee it to the wind. Mothers, wives, and daughters, let it shelter and defend. Equal rights, our motto is we're loyal to the end. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we sing this chorus from the mountain to the sea. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we sing this chorus from the mountain to the sea. Giving the ballot to our mothers. Thank you. It's really interesting to look at our town halls and see how many women showed up to take the Freeman's Oath in 1919, hoping to vote in a national election. Vermont was one, not one of the first uh, three quarters votes for the 19th Amendment. We had to wait till the federal government told us to. And there's a story about that. But this next one is a comic story. And the idea is that if men don't support this, it's going to happen, so you'll need our support later on. And there was a governor named Percival Clement, who was an anti-suffrage man. He was also part of the very powerful liquor lobby. So as you can imagine, a lot of the women were also involved in the temperance union and other social uh, reforms. So he really opposed it. And at the end of the term, he refused to hold a special session to vote on it. So we didn't make it into the first 19. I'm going to dedicate this to Miss Nellie Chase from um, Waterbury. She was a graduate of Bates College, and she was uh, mentored by Miss Colley at Green Mountain Cemetery. And after she graduated, she went to New Hampshire, and she became the president of the New Hampshire Suffrage Association. I'm going to play both parts here, the unenlightened man and the woman. It's called Winning the Vote. It's a vaudeville song. I've been down to Boston, boys, to see the folks and sights. Dear me, I heard such fuss and noise about these women's rights. That's as plain as my old coat, as plain as plain can be. That when you women bought the vote, 
Don't get no help from me, not from Joe, not from Joe, and he knows it, not from Joseph, you know, no, no, not from Joe, not from me, I tell you so. Here's the woman. Joseph, tell me something new, we're tired of that old song. We'll sell your seams and cook the meals. To vote won't take us long. We will help clean house. The one too large for man to clean alone. The state and nation, don't you see? When we the vote have won, yes, we will. And you'll help, for you'll need our help. Friend Joseph, yes, you will, for you're fun. So you better help us win. Here's Joe. You're just right, how blind a bed I ne'er had seen it thus. Tis true, the taxes you must pay without a word of fuss. You are fronted to the word of day without a no, no, note. Can you sing out where it will count? I'll help you win the vote. Yes, I will. Thank you, Joe. We'll together soon be voters. Yes, we will. If we'll all vote yes at the polls next fall. <laughs> and you'll hear a couple of um, strategies there to convince the men. And one that really worked was the idea of taxation without representation. At that point, women could inherit property, they could run businesses, they could sometimes vote in municipal elections or for the school board or the library board, but certainly not in the important elections. <laughs> and so that was an important argument they did. And you notice that the woman is saying, we'll still clean your house, we'll still <laughs> sew your seams. But that was called enlarged housekeeping that was a really important uh, debate topic, which is the role of women. Is it in the home, the angel at the hearth, the woman who's in charge of the men's and the children's spiritual development, um, certainly being in charge of food and clean health and clean water. So they used that. And they said, all we're asking for is enlarged housekeeping <laughs> so that we will take care of the wider home that you men have messed up <laughs> and we will start to do what our normal task is which just is to clean house <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this to Lucy Daniels let's see where is she anyway she's up here she was really radical because she decided not to take her husband's name her husband was also a suffragist, so she went by Lucy Blackwell, oh, sorry, Lucy Stone, and when she tried to vote, they said no, because we don't have your name. Your name needs to be your husband's. They were called the Stoners. <laughs> That's how they love that. And then the other person I want to talk about is Lucy Daniels over here. She was from Grafton, Vermont, and she inherited a huge property and thought she, she should vote because she was paying property taxes. And she refused and went down to Washington, D.C. and actually picketed the White House at the end, like 1919. And the, the uh, town fathers in Grafton actually took away some of her land because she hadn't paid her property tax. So she was ready. She was ready to start to protest. And again, a woman of some means who could do that and she was missed, so she didn't have children to take care of. And it's interesting because they, when she came back, they wrote horrible things about her in the paper. They actually put something on the side of their, her barn. And uh, what she was do, according to people who knew her, is she'd walk around town and she'd give 50 cents to all the young women, the young girls that she saw, and said, you start going to town meeting. Because when you grow up, you are going to be able to vote, and you need to know how that works. So that's Miss Lucy Daniels. So this is a patriotic tune, a lot of suffrage lyrics to it, but I picked, I think, the best one. And there's also a sheet music cover that's called Uncle Sam's Wedding. In fact, we need men and women. 
When Uncle Sam set up his house, he welcomed every brother. But in the space of his new life, he quite forgot his mother. Now his house is up in arms, a housewife he must find him to sweep and dust and set to rights the tangles all around him. Uncle Sam is long in years and he is growing wiser. He can say it was a mistake to have no misadvisor. Dad never got the reins in looking over their shoulder. Shout to dear old Uncle Sam, my old man to forgather. <coughs> now we're here, dear Uncle Sam, to help you in your trouble. And the first thing best to do is making you a double. Yankee Doodle will be glad to join in us in spreading the news abroad or all the land of Uncle Sam's great wedding. <laughs> so that was pretty effective as a strategy to join with men to help clean up the world the way we do, women clean up the home. And suffragist Frances Willard, and if you know Jane Addams, who worked with the poor, said that an army of women would help to bring about clean water and clean food. Because here in Vermont, a lot of women who had farms were, enabled to, were able to ensure that their children had clean water and good food. But if you lived in a tenement in Winooski, you didn't have the power to do that. So they were arguing for the vote to help all women have a sort of a, a better life beyond the domestic goddess that was part of our, our role. And I think of them thinking superhero house cleaners and we'll go and we'll fix up everything. But what happened is people like Jane Addams at Hull House and other people started to look at the folks who didn't have any access to power. Certainly the children who were working in factories and children in so-called work farms and um, uh, insane asylums who were often uh, set there. And what this Vermont person said, I love her because she's right in the middle there. She looks like Mrs. Santa Claus, but she was such a radical. Her name was Miss, Mrs. Annette Parmalee. And she was married to a man who was also really important in the abolition of slavery and the suffrage movement. So she, they both worked for the presence of a woman. They wanted a woman on every single board of a charity that involved women. And they called her Annette the Suffragette or Annette the Hornet because she, she never gave up. But she knew that in advocating for this, it's good to use humor a little bit to try to convince people. And so <laughs> there's a broadside over here that says, Equal Suffrage Association is debating whether or not men are ready for the vote. <laughs> and she said, you know, come and look respectable, which is what women were told. And she said, you know, men are too emotional to vote. <laughs> if you see them at a sporting event, they lose their minds. And if they're in a conflict with other men, it often re resorts to fisticuffs. And women can't win that way, so we're good at negotiating, and therefore, that's why we should have the vote. She was from Enosburg Falls. And the other thing she cared about so much is the factory conditions of both women and children. And in this next song called uh, What Means These Votes for Women, she talks about that. The joyless haunt of drudges where children toil and die. What means these votes for women? Just this the time has come when we with votes with freemen concerns of land and home then snap the ancient tether enthralling us too long and stoutly pull together to right a grievous wrong Shout the song of votes for women Breathe out upon the air Here it's no cheap patriot freeman Who the right will dare Sing the loud with lusty vigor To 
in protest before this. It's considered really, really a bad thing. And eventually the, the, the uh, hems went up. Because you remember when I did the Civil War program at the church, all the way down to the ground, but all of a sudden they started dressing for moving. And <laughs> the one thing that's interesting to me as, uh, as a Christian is how close the Christian church, especially the Protestant church, especially the Methodist Church, was involved in these social changes. I think about the Wesley, and I wonder if they allowed the women to meet in the basement. Uh, there was often a prohibition about women speaking. And so men would speak. And that's why we're not called suffragettes, as they are in England. It's suffragists. They were trying to figure out what. So they, they started with suffragettes. But when you see the, the parades, the men were walking along the side and sometimes in the front serve as guards to the women who were, you know, facing a lot of ridicule and worse. So the Christian church uses uh, familiar hymns to make their point. But again, people on both sides could look at the Bible. They could find evidence for women's suppression, women's second-rate level. And they also could find evidence, in the New Testament especially, for women's equality. So that was a big debate which led to some divisions in the women's suffrage movement. Well, this one is uh, for the suffrage movement in 1876. So if you can imagine our country celebrating our centennial and looking toward what it will be in 2076. Of course, we were there. But I love this because that there's this utopian idealism that we would eventually come up to the, what we, the promise of our creed. Some of you might recognize the tune. It's from the Methodist hymnal. I'm going to dedicate it to my, my grandma. She's up here. Minnie Clemens in Herkimer, New York. She first voted in 1921. She was 31 years old. And if any of you have any stories like that of, of ancestors who voted for the first time, come up and tell me later. It's just really inspiring. So this is a, a hymn. <laughs> hundred years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade, in statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence. These things will be altered one hundred years hence. Our laws then will be uncompulsory rules, our prisons converted to national schools. The pleasure of sitting, it's all a pretense, for so we will find it 100 years hence. Oppression and war will be heard of no more, nor the blood of a slave leave his print on the shore. Conventions will then be a useless expense, for we'll all go free suffrage a hundred years hence. Instead of speech making to satisfy wrong, we will join the glad chorus to sing freedom's song. And if the millennium is not a pretense, we'll all be good neighbors 100 years hence. I grew up 
up in Seneca Falls, New York, when, as my father used to say, before women's history. So if you have any of you have been to the National Park there, it's amazing. But when I grew up, where they had the first um, convention in 1940, 1848 and had the Declaration of the Rights of Women, it was a laundromat. And there was like a little New York State sign. So it's wonderful to go there and learn about this time. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I have two pictures of her. One is with her daughter Harriet, very Victorian looking, and one later on where she looks kind of like a church lady. But you know, she was such a radical. And there was a lot of problems in the whole group because she believed, I read the women's <coughs> Bible, she believed the Bible um, focused on the subjugation of women. And she was willing to talk about it. So people like Susan B. Anthony or Lucretia Mott said, shut up. <laughs> people don't want to hear that right now. But I thought she was pretty brave to do that. Because she had seven children, she stayed at home. And she had this legal mind that allowed her to be the writer of the movement. Susan B. Anthony was the one who went around and tried to get people involved. And Lucretia Mott, who went to the first Seneca Falls uh, convention, was interested in women's rights. But the last thing they said was, women should get the vote. And Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker, said, Lizzie, don't put that in. They will make us look ridiculous. So it wasn't time even to talk about the vote. It was just talk about things like having a, a say in where your child's custody goes if the marriage ends, or a say in you know, getting property that you inherit. So, um, but the liquor lobby, when they started going, really got involved because there was this current of reform, especially for the temperance movement. My grandma was a member of the WCTU, the, Christmas, cause the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And I used to think, oh, it was just a church lady thing, but it wasn't. They saw what alcohol was doing to families, to people in poverty, to everybody. And so they tried to, to get rid of that, but of course they were uh, opposed by all the liquor lobbies who were making a good deal of money. And they knew that once women could vote, it would be prohibition. So I'm going to dedicate this to the prominent uh, temperance workers, because a lot of the songs, I think unfortunately, pit the women who are pure, probably white, um, and the men from other places, prominent Ireland, who are drunks. <laughs> the idea of you know, the Irish workers who come in, they're just undesirable voters. And some, some of these songs are awkward to, to listen to, because you see them sort of saying, as Christian women, we know we should vote, but these other people shouldn't. There's a really embarrassing cover of Life magazine over there, where it shows a woman in a white gown and a parasol. And the title is, Four Voters. And of course, she's not one of them. And the other voters are you know, a gang member, a black person, and a drunken Irishman. So that was part of their argument. So Lucy Stone, the woman who didn't change her name when she got married, said, it's easier to see a drunkard than a principal. So here in this next song, the drunkard, of course, is an Irishman. And they were talking about being Bible marching women and Gog and Magog, I had to look it up, it's from the Old Testament, and they were, they were bad people, apparently. And uh, they used a Scottish tune that you recognize called Going to the Poles. If the men should see the women going to the poles, to put down the liquor traffic needed vex their souls. If we're angels as they tell us, can we want suppose that all the men will frown on us when going to the poles? We love our boys, our household joys, we love our girls as well. The love of love we cannot have, pick that we dare rebel. No discharge, we Christian women, from the war with sin. At the poles with Gog and Magog must our fight begin. Since we Bible marching mortars did it fright our souls, so all the men will frown on us when 
going to the polls. We love our boys, our household joys. We love our girls as well. The love of love is from above. It's that we ne'er rebel. So I've talked a little bit about that big wave of immigration, which included my ancestors from Poland, that made women uh, worry about all these foreigners and were they, should they be able to vote? Or should undesirable people like poor people be allowed to vote? So that was a, a big issue. Educated suffrage was something that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, my hero, thought about. But her daughter Harriet, when she grew up, she started working in New York City and she saw the immigrants there working in horrible conditions, and she thought that they can't make any choices for their children's purity of water or food or anything. So she worked with the unions there. And what happened later on is that even white women started to <coughs> understand that after the 1911 uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Women were locked in and then they left to their death. So they had a lot of debates about that, and it ended up with both sides, and they split into two, which is really awful. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is when um, women were working for the abolition of slavery, they wanted black people to vote. And so when that final thing came up after the Civil War, <coughs> women were not included. So they worked so hard, and black men were getting the right to vote and they were not. And that again led to a split in the, in the people because uh, they felt betrayed that they'd worked so hard. But on the other hand, uh, people like Wendell Phillips, who's another one of my heroes, an abolitionist said, the country could not <coughs> accept that much change at one time. This is the Negro's hour. Later on will be the women's hour. And of course that took decades and decades. This next song has, again, has two people debating suffrage and again talking about the drunk man who says he can vote and her women, her, his women know their place. Sing both parts. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find who knows it all without debate, he'll never change his mind. I asked him, what are women's rights? His answer seems to me. My mind on that is all made up. Keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb from forth the papa's calm. He squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him, should not women vote? He answered with a sneer. I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, who pondered deep all human love, the honest truth to know. I asked him, what of women's cause? The answer came to me. Her rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. I was pretty amazed by that idea of choosing our sphere. The early suffragists used the idea of our sphere is the home. We're just expanding it a little bit to do some housekeeping for the rest of the country or for the poor people. But this is saying women can choose their sphere. And that was pretty radical. And Katie Stanton actually went so far as to say that women, that maternity itself should be voluntary. And of course, everybody went nuts. <laughs> and of course, that's still in our, in our world today. And that was way before Margaret Sanger. But the one thing I wanted to tell you about is that uh, it's awkward and it's nuanced, but it's not as com it's complicated because women at the beginning were of some means. They were able to travel, perhaps. They might have had help with the children at home or with housekeeping. 
And that's, um, that's part of the movement at the beginning, and there's a certain racism, racism and xenophobia that's connected with that. So I wanted to go back to New York City. One of the reasons New York State got suffrage much before Vermont is they had a lot of immigrants in New York City. They had a lot of people who joined the, um, the, the unions. And despite some opposition because of cultural opposition to voting, they got there faster. And so this is a song that I'm going to dedicate to Ernestine Rose. She was a Jew. She wrote, uh, grew up in Poland, uh, daughter of a rabbi. And she came to America for freedom, but found that she could not own property. So she started working on that, not necessarily voting. But, uh, but she, was, she worked with these women. But then at one point she said, look, I was raised a Jew, but I'm an atheist. And they said, be quiet. <laughs> there are a lot of church ladies in this group, be quiet. But I'm really grateful that I found this, this song in the Library of Congress. A lot of songs were written in, in, in the languages of the workers. So this one's in Yiddish. And to get the translation, I asked Avram Pat. He's a representative from, from Vermont who was brought up uh, knowing Yiddish. And it, sung, it was sung in vaudeville by Bessie Chanashevsky. She was very, she was the queen of Yiddish theater. And you can tell by this moment, it's okay to be a suffragist. You're not considered an ugly woman who could never get a man, which is the way it started in the beginning. Uh, so it's funny. And then later on, her grandchild changed his name. Uh, instead of Tomaszewski, he became Thomas. And he's the conductor, Michael Tilson Thomas. So here we go. Anybody know Yiddish? Oh, good. <laughs> I'm trying my best, but it sounds like Yiddish. It sounds like German. <laughs> Viel Neues bringt jetzt heraus die Zeit, ich tänze nicht oder schlecht. Die Wabe werden sein gleich mit Leid, sie kämpfen so hoch und erreicht. Verschiedene Frauen für alle Reihen sehen in kleiner aus Plänen. Sie läufen nach Römen, wir spitzen die Gassen, sie rachen und schreit mit den Männern. In sie schreien, mit der Treuen, wer die Bitt der Anberein vor mir. Wenn geht den Plan, Herz tief, der viel den Mann. Tumme hat der Reure, wird verrascht ein Schlecht. Kaum kühlt die Trippi weht, führt ihm bald in sie sehen. Stellt sich ruhig, zwei Verlass, Leben zu Frauen recht. And the story here is that she's saying, if we get the vote, we can take over the world. And she said, women will have men have the babies so we can keep our flat stomachs. <laughs> and um, women can be the police. And on every corner, when they arrest a man, they'll let him go if he kisses them three times. So it's basically taking the whole suffrage movement and be having some lighthearted fun about it. Well, the early ladies I talked about were very genteel, but finally, you know, being genteel only takes you so far. And so Carrie Chapman, Kat, and others like Alice Paul took more of a radical uh, view of how to get the change. And so they saw that there is violent suppression of the vote for African Americans and poll taxes. So she, they started looking at voter equality, which is still with us today. They started to march, these huge marches. 3,000 women in 1911, 1912, 10,000 marchers, again, with men helping to keep, keep the peace. And this was amazing. Before President Wilson was inaugurated, he was not a supporter of suffrage. They had 250,000 onlookers, and there was violence from the crowd, but they, it was time to really make some, make some noise about this. And um, Wilson it was a southerner. He was a states' white man. He was very conservative. But finally, he sort of drank the Kool-Aid, because during World War I, women stepped up and did so much work. They were ambulance drivers. They were helpers. And they said, how can we not consider them citizens? So finally, 
um, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul, who was, she was um, trained in England, which is much more radical than that. They decided to, to, to actually picket the, state, the uh, White House. That was not done before, certainly not by women. And you can see them, they're called the Silent Sentinels. And they got beaten, they got taken to jail, some of them were force-fed. When they went on hunger strikes, even people like the, uh, one of the, the Webbs from the Shelburne family, she went to, to Washington to, to hold a sign. And what they were saying was, look, it's World War I, we're fighting for democracy. Why is there not democracy at home? And one of the signs that really made people mad was, Kaiser Wilson, how long must we wait for liberty? So it got pretty ugly, uh, but uh, again, they, they almost got the 19th Amendment. They needed one more vote. Did they go to Vermont? No. Did they go to Connecticut? No. They went to Tennessee. At first I thought, that's sort of strange. <laughs> but there's a great book called The Women's Hour. It reads like a thriller, really. What their argument was, it's embarrassing, but they said, you know, with Jim Crow, if you let our, our white women vote, we can clearly outvote any black people who manage to sneak through. Yeah. Yeah. So it was one of those things, you know, they're, they're, they had a reason, but they were in Nashville. And they were at this famous hotel, and the women, Sherry Catman Cat and um, Alice Paul, were downstairs. The men from the legislature, they're all men, went upstairs to talk to the anti suffrage men. And it was called the Jack Daniels Suite, <laughs> even though it was prohibition. And they came down reading, uh, wearing their red roses, which indicated you were against women's suffrage. And the women in the, in the floor tried to convince them, and it went back and forth. It's amazing how they were working on one vote, maybe not, maybe one vote. Finally, this one man, who was the youngest legislator in the Tennessee legislature, he. Um, he stood up, he, he had decided he was against women's suffrage. He got a telegram from his mother, <laughs> who was a suffragist, and she said, a boy should listen to his mother, please change your vote, and he did. Oh. Oh, he did, so it did pass. And then women got the vote in 1920, 1920 1921 in Vermont, and uh, there was only one woman from that early Seneca Falls, um, convention who actually was alive then. So all these women had worked all their lives but didn't get to do it. And she was Charlotte Woodard. She was an 18-year-old Quaker girl who sewed, sewed gloves for a living. She was from Gloversville, New York, and she went with her friends and signed that declaration and then became an activist in Philadelphia where a lot of the Quakers worked. So when they were arguing for this, um, they were smart not to use the Union songs from the Civil War. So this next one, they use a Confederate song. You might recognize it. It's called Bonnie Blue Flag. And the idea is that Alice Paul would, would sew a star on this big banner that she would raise, put down whenever a state said yes to the 19th Amendment. And so this is the final battle which they, which they won. Is a band of women and to a man are born, emerging from the darkness past and looking toward the morn. Their mothers labored, waited through a night without a star. The morning showed her suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Flag that bears the woman's star. <coughs> this band is all reforming, war shall be at an end. Bayonets and swords shall rust, we'll use the brain, the pen. Laden with precious freight now, thunders our progress car. The headlight waves our suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. That bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. So it was November 2nd, 
1920, 10 million women voted. Uh, three women for every five men, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who was against women's suffrage initially, and the first lady, who was Edith Wilson, and my grandmother, Minnie Clement Cummins. And in Vermont, it was 10,000 strong, and they were able to boot the uh, governor, who was against suffrage and part of the liquor lobby. Um, his name was Percival Clements. And who came in is James Hartness, who's down here. He's a pro-suffrage man. He was an industrialist from Springfield, who actually hired women during the Civil War. He paid them the same as men. So that's a story. I want to make sure it wasn't just women working. But the story isn't over. You know that. So it's hard won, but it's not done. And I didn't know this until COVID, where I got to read a lot. Native Americans were given the vote in 1948. There was a court case. And finally, Utah was holding out. And they finally gave the, gave the franchise 1962. It's astounding to me. And then Chinese Americans, we know a little bit about that story. They got it in 1946, after the war. And Japanese Americans in 1952, the year I was born. So. And of course, we know there's still barriers to voting all around the country. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good for the final song to think about that range of strategies and that range of people who tried to work for justice in their communities, in their parlors, in their state houses, in Washington. And it finally won, but it was 72 years. And after this presentation, please come up. I'll be up here and look at some of these women, especially the Vermonters and some of the uh, posters that we had here in Vermont. But this is the last song that comes from the same Tin Pan Alley um, company that published Gershwin. So you hear that Babe is playing something that's a little more Bodio Do, 1920s. <laughs> and also, there's a poster over here that said the type has changed. At the beginning, the suffragists were looked as women with warts who couldn't get a man, and they were ugly, and, they, and then and the one on the right is like, she's fashionable, she's sexy, she's independent. So it's sort of neat the way it, it changed over 72 years and became part of our culture. But this also, like the first song, looks at motherhood, but has the best title. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. <laughs> Greater than his mother, no man is half so good. No man is better than the wife he loves. Her love will guide him, whatever be tied him. She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else would kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you're all lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. Plunge this world in war and sadness. We must protest in vain. Someday, I pray, someday we'll hear her say, Stop all your madness, I bring you gladness. She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else would kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you're all lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother. And she's good enough to vote with
more if you sing with me. We started with the Battle Hymn of the Republic, so many words over the years. And I found a couple verses that are just charming because it goes beyond what it used to be, which is, when women can vote, there will be no war. There will be no inequity. And of course, we know women vote all kinds of ways. So this sort of talks about that. And I'm going to ask you to join along with the very famous uh, chorus, which is, glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> because Pete Seeger says, the concert is not over till the audience sings. <laughs> It's the right of every woman to mark out her path in life, to be a saint and soldier or a true and loving wife, to fill the joy with gladness and recall the world from strife as she goes marching on. to serve her nation in its every hour of need, her right to sit in judgment on her country's faith and creed, and show the world her courage by some high heroic deed, as she goes marching on. Glory, glory, It's her right to train her children in the home and in the school, to help in framing statutes and determine who shall rule, and like man to cast her ballot for a statesman or a fool as she goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, Thank you so much, and thanks to the Mont Humanities Council. Stay afterwards, we have some oh, a ladies' tea. You don't have to wear your hats. <laughs> but it's wonderful. And also, come on up and talk to me about your suffrage stories if you have any. Thank you so much.